part one of the Unit 3 notes, we will be covering ancient Greek philosophers and laws of atomic theory. In ancient Greece, there was a philosopher named Aristotle, and he believed that all matter, or hyle, was composed of four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. He also believed that all matter was continuous. That means that it is infinitely divisible, or that you could always break it down into smaller particles. He did not believe in the possibility of empty space or a vacuum. Another ancient Greek philosopher, Democritus, was the first person to propose that matter was not infinitely divisible. He believed that at some point you would reach basic building blocks that he called atomos, which were solid, indivisible, and indestructible objects which traveled through empty space. Different kinds of atomos would have different shapes and sizes, and the size, shape, and movement determine the properties which you would be able to observe. For our first checkpoint question, you are going to think about which philosopher was most believed during their time, either Aristotle or Democritus. And you're going to write out why you think their idea was more popular. At this point, you should pause the video and fill in your response in Kia before moving on. And please note, there is no right or wrong answer here. So you're just filling in your explanation for why you believe one or the other was more believed. While the concept of atomos is closer to our current understanding of atomic theory, technology was limited during this time period. Atomos was also beyond the realm of what could be seen. So it was impossible for Democritus to prove his theory. The presence of Aristotle's four elements could be felt in everyday life. This combined with the fact that he was more influential meant that his concept of four basic elements prevailed for almost 2,000 years. In 1661, Robert Boyle published a book called The Skeptical Chemist. Boyle argued against Aristotle's four elements and proposed the modern definition of the element. He believed that a substance is an element unless it could be broken down into two or more simpler substances. Boyle was a great proponent of modern experimental method and was one of the first scientists to truly use quantitative physical experiments. That means physical experiments which deal with numerical data. He is now considered one of the fathers of chemistry. All right, we now come to the first of three laws that we will be discussing in this part of the notes. The first is the law of conservation of mass. In 1785, Antoine Lavoisier stated that mass is neither created nor destroyed during ordinary chemical reactions or physical changes. All mass present in the beginning must also be present in the end. Now in the picture on the bottom, you can see a diagram of his setup. So on this end, he had glassware which was heating up water, which turned to steam. It would pass through this section right here, which had an iron rifle bar barrel embedded within coals. On the other end, he would then condense the steam and collect the water. But what he saw was that he was collecting less water on the other side of this experiment, and the mass of his iron rifle barrel was going up. What he was essentially doing here was creating rust, or iron oxide. And he was also producing a combustible gas, hydrogen. The experiment is shown in a small clip from the video Einstein's Big Idea, which is linked on my YouTube channel. So you can watch just this specific clip for Antoine Lavoisier's experiment. All right, for our second checkpoint question, we are going to be using the law of conservation of mass in order to determine the mass of water which is produced from this chemical reaction. Now, if you see a problem like this, you should fill in what the masses are for each of your uh, different elements or compounds. 
So it says that we have 16.0 grams of methane, which is CH4. So we're going to fill in 16.0 grams. It's reacting with 64.0 grams of oxygen. And then on this side, we are producing 44.0 grams of carbon dioxide and an unknown amount of water. So from here, we can simply solve the equation in order to determine the value for x. So if I were to combine these two numbers right here, that is a total mass of 80.0 grams. From here, we can subtract the 44.0 grams from either side. And then we determine that x is equal to 36.0 grams of water. So with this law of conservation of mass, it's not saying that the mass of a specific you know, element or compound won't change. It's saying that the overall mass of the entire system is going to remain constant. So atoms can move around and join together in different ways, but the total mass of one side of the reaction will always equal the total mass of the other side of the reaction. Our next law is the law of definite proportions. And this one was created by a French chemist, Joseph Proust, in 1806. He stated that every sample of a chemical compound contains the same elements and exactly the same proportion by mass. This is also sometimes known as the law of constant composition. I tend to use the law of definite proportions. You can see in our example here that if you consider water, which is H2O, you have a single oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. The mass is 16 parts oxygen and then two parts hydrogen. So you end up with 11% by mass hydrogen and 89% by mass oxygen. So no matter how much water you have or where you get that water, it will always have that same percentage breakdown. Our third and final law for today is the law of multiple proportions. And this one was created by John Dalton in 1808. So he stated that if two or more different compounds are composed of the same two elements, then the ratio of the masses of the second element combined with a certain mass of the first element is always a small, sorry, always a ratio of small whole numbers. Now I know that's a very long sentence and it might not make a whole lot of sense at first. So we're going to use this example right here to demonstrate what he's talking about. So let's say that we have these two compounds that contain the same exact elements. So carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide both only contain carbon and oxygen. If I had carbon monoxide, which had exactly one gram of carbon, and I had carbon dioxide, which also contained exactly one gram of carbon, the amount of oxygen that that one gram of carbon would bond to would be 1.33 grams or 2.66 grams. And it's very clear that this is exactly twice as much. This essentially tells us that we can't combine half atoms or fractions of atoms. I needed exactly twice as much mass because I have exactly twice as many atoms which are bonding to that carbon. All right, for our next checkpoint question. Sucrose, or table sugar, always consists of 42.0% carbon, 6.5% hydrogen, and 51.5% oxygen. There are never any other elements present in pure sucrose, and the percentage breakdown between carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen never changes. Which of the three laws we have discussed so far would confirm this? This will be the law of definite proportions. That was the one that we discussed, which was created by Joseph Proust. 
And the key here is that we always have the same percentage breakdown. So it's always these three elements, only th these three elements, and the percentage is always the same between them. If we were comparing different compounds which had the same elements, that would be multiple proportions. And if we were talking about the mass being constant through a chemical reaction, that would be conservation of mass. All right, next we come to Dalton's atomic theory. And remember, Dalton was the person who came up with the, uh, the last law that we looked at, the law of multiple proportions. So Dalton comes up with this uh, summary of atomic theory that kind of combines everything that is known about atoms and elements up to that time. So it was the first complete attempt to describe all matter in terms of atoms and their properties. So point one. All matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. So again, similar to the idea of atomos back in ancient Greece with Democritus, but now you know a little more modern and able to actually be scientifically proven. Uh, number two, atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and other properties. So he's saying here that uh, any given carbon atom is exactly the same as any other carbon atom. Number three, atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed. So he's saying that the atom is the smallest piece that you could break something down to. Number four, atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form chemical compounds. So that's the multiple proportions law that we've already talked about. And number five, in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, and rearranged. So all of these points together make up Dalton's atomic theory. That concludes part one of our unit three notes. When we come back for part two, we're going to be discussing the discovery of subatomic particles.